This is a Digital Music Trends 143 on the 31st of July 2013. This week, Spotify's earnings, audio partners with Live Nation, SoftBank's bid for Universal Music, ASCAP versus Pandora's acquisition of a terrestrial radio, and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the week's news in the digital music industry. And uh, DMT is available on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Stitcher and many more. And if you enjoy the show, please make yourself known, email, comment on YouTube or forward it to your colleagues. Your help is what makes DMT grow every single month and uh, that's, that's great. We saw a pretty big increase uh, in the past uh, five or six weeks. And so this, week's, uh, this week I'm really happy happy to welcome uh, two great guests on the show. So first up is Dave Allen, who is current uh, director of insights uh, and the digital media at north.com. And he's also adjunct professor on uh, digital brand strategy at the University of Oregon, as well as uh, being uh, the uh, former bass player in the British post punk outfit, the Grand Gang of Four. So hi, Dave, and great to have you on. How's it going? Yeah, thanks for having me on again. And um I don't think I'm former yet. Uh, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't know how to put it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're not, uh, you're not actively touring, but you're, you're still around. That's, that's great. I don't like to be doing anything, but uh, last time I checked, we're all still a band. You know? That's awesome. That's great. And, so, and then uh, um, this week also we got uh, Glenn Peoples, uh, who's the editorial analyst uh, at Billboard, where he writes some fantastic pieces on what's happening in the music industry today. And if you don't follow Glenn's work or Ready, you should go uh, on Twitter, it's at Billboard Glenn, or check out uh, billboard.com slash biz. So hey Glenn, and great to have you on, how's it going? Hi, it's going well, thanks for having me again. It's great to have you. And so this week, uh, I wanted to start by looking at a story that I wanted to cover last week, but I didn't get a chance to do because uh, we always run long. And so, uh, but I think it was pretty important just to look at the situation of the, of the music industry in general and, and uh, uh, for a major label to have such an incredible bid placed on it. Uh, it, it was qu- it's quite an interesting item. So uh, what happened is that, if you haven't heard about it yet, is that um, the, um, the Japanese carrier SoftBank made a bid on uh, Vivendi's Universal Music, and this bid was for $8.5 billion. Million, uh, dollars. Uh, so it was an interesting bid because uh, most analysts place the value of Universal at somewhere between five and six billion. So it kind of goes to show uh, the fact that Vivendi didn't uh, agree to this uh, acquisition. The fact that the company has a lot of confidence in the music industry and its uh, entertainment division on which it's focusing a lot of its efforts. Uh, and it also highlights how um, you know it gives you a bit of perspective on the numbers as well because we we always hear earnings call of um, calls of Apple and other big tech companies uh, and we hear that you know Apple for example has uh, tens of billions of dollars in, in cash reserves and to hear this kind of bids it kind of gets into your head again that the music industry is still a relatively small uh, industry compared to the to what the technology giants are, are making these days and so uh, first of all what do you what do you make of this offer and uh, do you think that Universal Music can be a, an, an appealing purchase for uh, another corporate giant like SoftBank, for example? Uh, Glenn, what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I was, I was a little surprised by the bid. Um, not that the bid would be, be made, because uh, I understand completely why uh, a company involved in, in mobile carriers would want content like this. Yeah. I, think, I think music and um, mobile go very well together. It was a large bid. Um, quite a premium to pay for the company and, and maybe it was so big just to get Vivendi's attention and uh, um, smaller bids maybe have not got the same attention so it's sure. a little surprising that even a bid that big didn't do the job yeah. uh, but from a strategic point of view it makes perfect sense why the bid was made um, and in, will we see more of these in the future you, you know it's, it's hard to say I mean I, I don't think Apple wants to get into the content in, in IP business yeah, um, yeah. It's happy being a technology company, but there are probably other technology companies that will want to leverage uh, content, whether it be recorded music or uh, publishing assets like Universal has. Absolutely. And, and of course, there will be problems in terms of also approvals if uh, a company like Apple wanted to do uh, an acquisition of this kind because uh, they own uh, the majority of the digital, digital market uh, worldwide. So I think there will be some issues raised by uh, both US and uh, European authorities if something like that was to be proposed. Yeah. Uh, at least that's what I, that's what I imagine. Uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, I'm wondering whether... Uh, you know, you, you work with brands a lot and Universal in the last few months or in the last couple of years actually has been 
port portraying itself uh, as much uh, as a brand uh, uh, and, and as a label is sort of on par. Uh, and I think that's, that's an interesting point that maybe the universal uh, brand carries uh, quite a bit of value on its own uh, without any relation to the actual artists that carries these days. Is, do, do, do you feel like that that's uh, a potential uh, reason why the company could go at a premium and uh, or, or do you feel like the artists make universal and whether the brand is there or not um i think there's, there's, it feels like there's a lot of questions in 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 in, in what you're attempting to ask yeah uh, and there's a lot of answers there's a lot of answers to it first i think first of all i hadn't uh, heard news of this so i don't clearly have um, a lot to say about it but now i understand um, you know, what Glenn just explained, what's going on. Uh, you know, the sad part for me always uh, as a copyright holder myself is uh, musicians are never invited to the table. Even if this deal was to go forward, um, we would just have to eat it. You know, it's like, hey, you're now owned by mega corporate Japanese company. Uh, that's just an aside um, because, you know, I, uh, a lot of our, I think a lot of the, um, the sort of issues around um, music in general and technology in general and whether it's called content or not, um, the debate often uh, leaves us uh, to one side. Yeah. Um, now, from a branding perspective, um, I don't think it would necessarily make a difference whoever owns this giant catalog um, because often, you know, when we're working with um, uh, brands ourselves here, we have to deal with, obviously we're dealing with the, the record company for master side and publishing uh, on perhaps another company for the publishing side. It tends to all be, uh, be uh, funneled through management anyway, you know, like we deal with managers or we deal with um, uh, licensing houses, music licensing houses that handle all of that. Yeah. So again, I don't see this being something that would be uh, disruptive in terms of branding and advertising. Yeah. Uh, more interestingly to us at the moment is why did Publicis and uh, Omnicom form a giant, massive, mega corporation in advertising? It doesn't make any sense because, just for a second, slightly off topic, you know, oh, sure. what, what we're seeing here, uh, what we see anyway in a company our size is that clients want agileness and speed. They don't need to wait around while decisions are made in a giant company. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, this, this sort of trickles down slightly into, okay, just uh, was it Sony you said is trying, uh, or PeopleSoft, sorry, um, you know, they're trying to buy in here. What does that mean ultimately? I have no idea. Yeah. You, you'd have to see how it panned out. Yeah. But one thing, I think one thing's for certain we could say is I don't see why Apple would have any interest in, in doing a deal of that, that yeah. nature, especially at that price, even though just because Apple's got loads of cash, I think they always look at things from a hardware, software play. Yeah. You know, that, that was where they began with the iPod and iTunes, and it obviously elevated their business through yeah. the stratosphere for a while. Yeah, sure. And Glenn, do you, do you feel like Universal has a value uh, as a brand uh, of its own right, or is it still just a label? <laughs> well, I think within Universal there are a lot of brands. Um, and I'm not sure that um, the Universal brand itself uh, means a whole lot. But there are artist brands within Universal, mm -hmm. uh, both in the publishing and the recorded music side. And there are labels uh, brands as well, such as Verve and Bluno. And yeah. don't forget that um, you know, Universal now has a lot of old EMI labels. Yeah. So, so the answer is, is I guess, the, a weird yes. Yeah. There are definitely brands involved, but maybe not the Universal uh, corporate brand so much. Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. And uh, and Glenn, I wanted to move on on your piece about uh, entitled "Misinterpreting the Size, Shape, and Momentum of the Digital Music Marketplace," which is brilliant because it highlights uh, a few of the issues that we've seen in the last uh, ten days or so, since especially since the streaming uh, debate heated up with uh, the Tom Tom York. Uh, 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 issues uh, with Atoms for Peace uh, and uh, uh, so you kind of you, you look at uh, how sometimes numbers can be taken out of context to narrate a number of different stories and how 
uh, those uh, are not always accurate. So you, you have issues of, with headlines, uh, for example, like uh, uh, digital downloads are plummeting uh, as users turn to streaming. Also, the headline music streaming is expected to decimate uh, iTunes uh, in Australia. And also the headline, the album is headed for a comeback. So all these are s sort of uh, generalized uh, uh, arguments that I guess serve uh, explaining what's uh, trying to explain what's happening to a mainstream public and uh, reducing multifaceted is issues of the industry to a very simple uh, sort of black and white uh, which, which they are not so yeah. how do you feel that we can keep the debate moving without because uh, i guess that, that it's very difficult not to fall into these cliches and so you know what how do you how do you feel like the media could handle these issues without uh, going to these uh, sweepy generalizations and and some of the pro pro proposals you made in terms of changing those headlines are actually to become a little bit more specific as to what they're talking about or what time frames they're talking about right yeah yeah the time frame i think was when i pointed out that itunes or streaming is is not going to decimate itunes australia anytime soon yeah maybe by 2020 but unless you put in that qualifier of uh, picking a year then that's a pretty bad forecast to make. Yeah. Uh, in 50 years, I'm sure streaming will decimate iTunes, Australia sales, but, but what's that mean right now? I mean, 50, why look that far out? <coughs> yeah. um, I, think, I think, you know, even within the music trades um, and, and people who do follow music closely, I still think the story is, is being uh, got wrong a little bit and definitely by the mainstream press. Um, and I think they just need to do their homework a little more and have a better understanding of what the real trends are. Yeah. For example, uh, I think people made a, a big deal that tracks were in negative territory. They're down about 2% through the first half of the year. And digital albums were up about 6%. Um, that doesn't mean sales are plummeting just because tracks are in negative territory. Um, it means that track growth has been falling year over year. Yeah. And it's been predictably falling over time. 2010 was a, a little low, and then it went back up a few years. But the line, the, the general trend has been down. And so it's not a surprise that growth would be in negative territory at some point. Yeah. Um, the other trend is that digital albums growth rate has been higher than tracks over recent years. And so it makes sense that this year, digital albums are in positive ter territory, tracks are in negative so they're just following trends that have been established over the years. Um, there really is no new story here. It doesn't mean anything has shifted in the music business yeah. because of first half results. Um, it just happens to coincide with a big gain in streaming. And I think streaming's uh, uh, greater awareness of streaming in the marketplace, especially because of, of what you mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, Tom York, uh, especially, you know, talking about this. And that was, what, a week and a half ago? Yeah. So we're still yeah. talking about this a week and a half ago. That's a pretty big topic uh, in the business world. Um, and I think it, it shows how, how important it is to the business and, and how uh, controversial a topic it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dave, do you feel in the same way that uh, some of the issues are being uh, misrepresented in the press too? Yeah, I do. I, you know, I think um, <clears throat> as a digital strategist, uh, you see this in lots of different areas, not just in music or streaming. Um, it's like link bait. You know, it's just like let's get some wild headline out there that makes everyone look in. The the data is suspect. Uh, we really don't know half of what's going on, and then we have to make some assumptions, which is really unfair. Yeah. Um, it would be great to get really solid data. Um, my thinking around this is teaching young people, undergrads especially, and having uh, three uh, young adults of my own now, um, um, I, I'm sensing that the uptick in digital album sales and, and perhaps the falling off of tracks and all this business that uh, Glenn mentioned is, I think it's becoming generational. I, I'm beginning to think through ideas about the tactile generation versus the young people who have known nothing else but digital, nothing else but free, as in Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, you know, everything's free. Um, and the simple fact that my research has shown for many, uh, well, at least a few years now, that young people want to rent music, they don't want to own it. So to Glenn's point, we might say in 2020, we will have seen this generation really switch over to 
not even paying subscriptions on Spotify, just putting up with the ads. Um, there could be more awareness of streaming, absolutely, but it doesn't lead to sales. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we saw that with YouTube. You know, kids were, I, I, I often do each year, at the beginning of each year, I'll poll my class just uh, as a, a hobby of my own to say, what's your favorite um, way of accessing music these days? And YouTube was far and away number one for a long, long time. Yeah. Spotify yeah. seems to have taken over that that number one slot. But then you just, you know, SoundCloud is high. Um, YouTube stays high. Pandora, the, no one, the kids hate it. Um, you know, it's like, so now we're going to see another, yet another generation. Uh, you know, this fall I start another new year of undergrads. And it'll be f great to find out from them what, just what they think about this. Because... Yeah. The Tom thing, the Tom York thing, even I corrected myself after my first initial response to it because I realized as a musician and copyright holder, I fell into the same trap of the emotion of the subject and then stepping back again as a digital strategist and you referred to the, the post that I wrote at length with Justin Spohn, um, is this is just the, a link, a final link in a chain of the beginning of the recording industry that set up a system that was always bad and benefited the system, you know, the recording industry itself, um, because we never got paid really well. It was really hard to make music from selling music, uh, sorry, make money from selling albums. Uh, the money was made on the road, the t-shirts, the merch. Nothing's really changed. What we're seeing is just um, a cultural shift where young people want to rent, not own. So Spotify is I think a, a typical example of the last piece of that li that chain link. I don't know what could come beyond this now. You know, it's like, all right, this is how we access our music. So, for at least a couple of decades, again to Glenn's point, by 2050, streaming could be it. That's it. Now, how to monetize that? I really don't know. Um, you know, Spotify stays alive because of Silicon Valley millions of dollars, 90 million a year, I think it takes to keep it running. You know, even though it makes money, it's not in profit. Pandora is still struggling out there as an internet radio uh, online vehicle. Uh, we'll see. But, you you know, I think it's time actually for musicians themselves, and, and I include myself, to say, this is how it is. This is what's happening. Yeah. The, yeah. In, the, like, you know, there's a philosophical question, uh, 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 a point here that I like to make is, the internet didn't make this happen. It was this open source vehicle, this low barrier to entry where, you know, back in the Napster days, the two Sean's didn't have to play with legal licensing, paying copyrights. They just understood that the Internet is this vast platform that you can build something upon and then look for the, the, the financial profit or financial income piece later on oh, it, with the help of, of VCs. Yeah, absolutely. And Glenn, I've got some uh, um, hot of the press numbers on Spotify, actually, that just came out through the Financial Times. And the report is that from the financial statements filed in Luxembourg, uh, I would assume it's today, uh, the company went from 190 million euros of sales in 2011 to 434 million euros of sales in 2012, uh, whilst the losses uh, went from 50, from 45.4 million euros in 2011 to 58.7 million euros in 2012. So, I mean, I'm just looking at the, you know, the headline numbers here. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be more insights to be had from uh, looking at the in-depth accounts of, of what happened but it does look like the uh, the sales more than doubled whilst the losses only increased by uh, 30 million dollars which is uh, much less than, than doubling so I guess yeah. in a way okay it's uh, it's still losing a, a bunch of money uh, for sure but uh, it, it's not losing it at the same pace as it is gaining income so that that's got to be a good sign right Sure. Yeah, the loss as a percentage of revenue was lower this year than the previous one. Absolutely. I think the, the most important thing to, to keep in mind when looking at, at Spotify's uh, earnings numbers is that you're actually looking at financial performance in a lot of different markets at once. And some markets like Sweden and Norway and Netherlands, they do very well and they've been in those markets for a long time. And then you have the United States, which is a big market, but they've only been there uh, two years. And they've been in Australia and New Zealand less than uh, 
a little over one year now. But as in terms of those numbers that we've seen, it was about half the year because they entered uh, Spotify entered New Zealand, Australia in May of last year. Yeah. So, so the business model will mature uh, at different rates depending on the market, and also um, it, it it means that there's kind of a lag time. I think I, it makes sense that the business model based on getting subscribers based on free listening is going to have higher expenses in early years than in later years. Yeah. And what we've seen is the cost of sales decreases a percent of revenue from 2011 to 2012. So they, they are paying out less a percent of rev, a lower percent of re- revenue to rights holders yeah. as the company grows and gets scale and matures in different markets. And I think that's, A, I think that's really important because it shows that the business model can work. It's not profitable yet, but it can work. Uh, given enough scale and given enough time in newer markets to mature, it's going to be keeping more revenue and it's going to be, um, you know, it's not going to have, what was it last year, 97% of revenue yeah. they paid out to rights holders. Um, obviously, that's unsustainable. Well, I, I might have got that number wrong, but luckily I have it right here in front of me. Mm. Um, that seems high. Yeah, it was 97 last year and there was 80, 83.5% this year. Right. So the decrease in cost of sales as a percent of revenue uh, is very important. That shows the model's maturing, and I think that's really the most important thing to look at here. Now, whether or not that's ultimately good for artists, that's a whole different story. I think some artists say, well, it's an unsustainable model and we're not getting paid enough. I think it's a sustainable model over the long term. Whether or not artists are being paid enough is, is a whole separate conversation. Yeah, and, and there was a great uh, um, open editorial on Billboard by David Macias, actually, that I would, uh, uh, I'm going to link to in the show notes, uh, that I would suggest people go mm-hmm. and check out, where he's the president of label services and management company, Th- 30 Tigers. He wrote a really balanced piece on uh, the, the, the hard numbers, essentially. He's talking about uh, an artist, for example, on his label uh, that makes about two, uh, $2,037 from 400,000 streams, uh, streams in the current market. Uh, and uh, if, if you apply the current market share of Spotify, which is 0.5%, give or take, for the U.S. population, uh, to the market share that it has in Norway, for example, uh, then you would come to like almost a 70 grand a year worth of, of streaming. And so that would become a much more sustainable type of income especially if it uh, if it will in the long run have a, some sort of cannibalization on, on that on the front i mean of course it's always hard to make those sort of extrapolations but it's it makes paints a little bit of a rosier picture on, on streaming dave can I, can I jump in yeah i, sure. I mean i i, I think it's um uh, there's a false equivalence there of like comparing the u.s with norway like you know norway the population of norway um, and sweden is probably the size of a couple of big cities in the united states they're also very, very um, supportive of their uh, own uh, country's entrepreneurs. So the idea that everyone's jumped in in Sweden and is paying, you know, to use Spotify is a sort of a national pride setup. So what we hear in the United States, so th- this is why we'll never get to seventy thousand dollars a year. That's where I was at before streaming, but I'm not now. I'm, I'm at about twenty thousand. Um, is is uh, the competition is, is quite fierce, you know. I mean, you've got all of the same major music catalogs in all of the, in all of the matching services. So if it's audio, Spotify, etc., they only can access the, the catalogs that are available to everybody yep. for license. Um, Pandora suffers more because it set itself up as an online radio station, not a streaming company. So that has less catalog. Um, and then you have a very confusing... Um, set of numbers and I'm going to always focus on young people so let's say you're 17 18 years old you, you know your disposable income is not the same as somebody who's um, uh, like working at my company I could look around there's a lot of young people who work for me good salaries health benefits they may be happy to pay 10 bucks to Spotify another 10 to Pandora and or, or RDO or whoever's out there these days and the problem is the catalogs are all the same, you know, so when do you scale back to just one? Um, and, and also, the, you know, it's like a little bit like the cable TV model. It's like there's a lot of stuff you don't want for that $10 a month. Yeah, so yeah. I think the business has to mature much further 
before we see um, um, less confusion for, say, trying to get n the new audience, the young people who would be quite happy to listen to ads in the stream versus someone who's willing to pay to get out of that situation. Yeah. I think yeah. there's a gap there somewhere in the demographic, in the audience, that if Spotify, for instance, could manage to work that out, then they may be able to increase their, their, their users even more in the United States. Yeah. But yeah. I wouldn't ever worry about what's going on in, in uh, Norway or Sweden. You know, it's just like, yeah, that's great. They got that. They killed it. That's awesome. And that was like their, their launch pad to success in the rest of the world. Yeah. And now yeah. they have to try and repeat that. But I'd say that's a very difficult rock to push up a hill yeah. in the United States. Uh, in the U.S., we're seeing companies uh, all over the place trying to increase uh, their base and reach mainstream consumers. I mean, we've seen Daisy's reported uh, negotiations with carriers for partnership, and also last week uh, we saw uh, Ardio partner up with Live Nation for uh, to actually sp uh, actively sponsor LiveNation.com, which is the homepage of the music giant, uh, uh, the live music giant. So in the deal. Um, Users who are shopping for tickets will be able to register for audio and uh, listen, to, listen to tracks uh, right off the bat because, of course, audio has a free trial. Uh, and uh, audio will also be sponsoring uh, a couple of uh, Live Nation's country music festivals, uh, which is an interesting demographic that they're trying to hit to try and get uh, some of those uh, users that wouldn't otherwise consider a streaming service to sign up and, uh, and, and give it a go. And also they're going to be incorporated into the ultimate chart that Live Nation has on its service, which is... Uh, um, uh, built as part of that big champagne acquisition for from last year or uh, yeah last year i believe and uh, so uh, these are all really good things that you know are going to increase the awareness of audio probably more than uh, plastering new york city with a uh, tens of thousands worth of uh, billboards uh, for for the service i think and uh, but uh, you know, what's your take on the deal? Do you think that uh, we're going to see more of these uh, uh, in the next few months as uh, streaming services uh, realize they have to hit critical mass or face uh, demise, essentially, at this point? Um, I, I mean, it, you know, everything you just said is, <clears throat> is an obvious extension of where the music business itself, the entire industry, whether it's a streaming company, whether it's Live Nation as a... Uh, sign artists, you know, directly to then promote concerts and, and then bundle everything together. This yeah. is all great. This is great. And, and if, you know, with my business hat on, it's like, oh, sure, that, that makes a lot of sense. The bit that's missing um, is what happens to the, the farm system, as it were, the feeder system of bands that are not going to be in this Live Nation model. Um, you know, they're not going to be part of that grand, grand scheme. Um, it's, it, what we're seeing is it's, it's harder and harder for those musicians starting out to make any living whatsoever. Yeah. And so what, let's move to 2020 or even to 2050, you know, how is there going to be an adjustment that, that bands can do what Gang 4 did? You just hit the road, you work hard, you, you, know, you get the press, you sign a record deal, even though the record deal is awful, um, and so on. I mean, the, the, even that piece is all missing now because um, the atomization of music across industries um, means less than a cent, you know, for a stream. Uh, it means the, the idea that, that we're told in all of these, these streaming companies it leads to sales is, I think, a, a, a false uh, idea. Um, if, if it led to sales, we would see, surely, the rise of sales um, it wouldn't be hard to map that. Um, but if people are just listening and renting, as it were, not buying, uh, then we're not, we're not going to see a trickle down to the artists themselves at the lower level. Uh, and this is something that, that uh, we're talking about in the New Yorker piece at the moment, if that ever comes to fruition. I, I hope it does because it's been an interesting conversation. There's no solutions just now. Yeah. And, and, and <clears throat> I want to be transparent here. I'm on the board of a, a local company in here in Portland called Cash Music. It's cashmusic.org. Yep. Uh, we have a summit tomorrow. It looks like it's going to be incredibly, um, well, it's, it's sort of overpopulated, so we're going to have to maybe move to a bigger venue. That looks right, uh, yeah. It's really awesome. Um, and it's all open source. And what we're doing is we're just building a platform for the artists I mentioned who don't get to play in this big, big arena. 
um, to plug and play our, uh, our platform into their own websites and sell everything themselves directly with no middlemen. Yeah. So we have to try and keep the conversation, um, you know, let's not forget the content creators. Yeah, right? sure. We can buy, people soft can go out and buy uh, Universal if Universal decides we want that $8 billion. But you've got to keep the creators uh, alive too. You know, they can't all drop off because there's no way to make a living. Because 2020 on, there could be less interesting music coming in and God forbid we're just living in a back catalog world. Now, <laughs> I'm, not, uh, sure. I'm not that negative. I'm way more optimistic that if you want to create, you will always create. But we mustn't make it hard for creators to yeah. scrape by, you know, or harder than it ever was. I'm not Absolutely. saying harder now than it ever was, but let's be careful there, you know, that's yeah. all. Yeah, sure. And uh, Glenn, do you find it weird to see a company like uh, Audio, which is relatively small, uh, essentially sp sponsoring uh, the site of a huge uh, giant like Live Nation? That it's, it's kind of like an imbalance there, isn't it? Well, you know, it's a good partnership. Yeah. And I, I think that's a functionality that Live Nation needs. And I think it's visibility that Audio needs. Um, you know, country music is, is a genre that typically lags other genres in adoption of digital services. Country fans are, have taken to Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest, but they don't buy digital music at the rates of other uh, fans of other genres. So yeah. it's, a, it's an area that uh, needs to be developed. Rhapsody spent uh, quite a few years working on the country market specifically. And I think it's, it's been a tough nut to crack for subscription services. Yeah. But outside of the crossover artists, and you're always gonna have Taylor Swift being streamed artists like that but I think for core country artists um, streaming is a streaming service like Spotify for example or RDO um, it's just not there yet but but you know I, I think they want to reach out to all fans um, in country just being one group yeah, and, and uh, I think uh, I, I don't have the figures in front of me right now, but I remember a, f a couple of months ago on the show we had a we there was an article that came out with a breakdown of the different uh, uh, sales numbers for different genres, and it's staggering how we talk about the music market as a whole. But like each genre has got such a completely different uh, share between sales, downloads, uh, streams, and uh, and the numbers are mind-boggling uh, as, uh, as as far as the differences are concerned. Country fans predominantly buy CDs, and yeah. they haven't moved a lot to digital downloads. But, you know, it's a different genre because uh, people listen to radio, yeah. and then they go to a mass merchant uh, retailer, to, like Target, Best Buy, Walmart, to buy the CDs. Yeah. And uh, it is quite unique in that sense, where radio and, and old-fashioned retail are still very dominant. Yeah. I think, so, um, you know, it's something I, <clears throat> I talk about, too, is um, there's nothing new in technology. Uh, you know, there's this idea that with the advent of the internet, somehow new demographics arrived, and it's like people who live on the internet. I say, no, 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 it, it's a, it's us. You know, we live analog lives. Um, and so, really, what you just described there is when SoundScan was first introduced into the United States. I think Sting was number one at the time with "I Dream of Turtles" or something, whatever his solo album was. Um, and then SoundScan the next week <clears throat> shows what's really happening and the top 20 was full of country and hip hop artists mm -hmm. and Sting was plunged back down to like 109 because that was the days when you shipped CDs and that shipping number got you to number one. Yeah. When Soundscan arrived, the country artists and the hip hop artists who had really solid fans who bought every copy of everything that came out, that proved that there is uh, lots of genres out there that can really create income. And that's why we see um, artists working within these genres and staying within these genres because there are people today who will keep buying their music. Yeah. And, you know, perhaps, you know, greater minds of mine need to get together and, and, and find ways to really focus on these niches. And I don't mean just long tail, I mean actual, you know, it's like the the 1,000 fans model, you know, you just get 1,000 fans to spend a couple hundred bucks on you. If you can sell direct, for instance, um, I'm, I'm switching back to the online model, then we're going to see, uh, we could see uh, upticks of sales. How those sales are tracked, though, would be interesting. I, I'm just thinking Billboard, you know, yeah. that these, these, these sales are not going to show up on Billboard charts, I, I presume. But then that doesn't mean that you can't have a system that does track those sales. 
and new charts, you know, to reflect reality because that's what I'm saying. SoundScan reflected reality. And Glenn, to your point about uh, country fans definitely still buy CDs and go to the big box stores to buy them. You know, what's going on? What's the underbelly of that look like mm -hmm. you know, in, in an online world? Yeah. I think uh, two points here. Um, SoundScan does track a lot of, of uh, suppliers, you know, fulfillment companies. Uh, Bandcamp, for example, right. reports its sales information to SoundScan, and that includes vinyl, uh, CDs, and I imagine cassettes. There are a lot of cassettes for sale on Bandcamp. Um, <laughs> but I think that model that you're describing, this direct-to-fan, and I'm thinking of something like Pledge Music or Kickstarter, Yeah, I think is something that will evolve and, and could be very good for artists in the event that royalties decrease over time because of streaming. If people are actually purchasing less, then what can artists do to A, make a better connection with fans and, and B, monetize that connection better? Uh, something's going to need to make up that difference. Yeah. And I think that platforms like this are a great example of, of ways that um, artists can really communicate better with their fans and, and do more with it. And, and it's a revenue source ultimately. Uh, yeah. It's a marketing tool, and it's a revenue source. So when I look at streaming taking over uh, digital activity and digital sales, it doesn't worry me so much because I, I think that other platforms will be able to step in. Mm -hmm. Not that it's going to be an easy and painless transition, but I think other platforms will step in. Yeah. Pledge Music, Kickstarter yeah. are two good examples of that. Yeah, sure. no, I, I totally agree, and I... I, I I think, you know, like that's the basis of the cash music idea is here's the platform, <clears throat> but it's just one piece of the puzzle for independent artists. You know, it's like mm -hmm. you do need to be in Spotify. Don't worry about whether you're getting enough money from it or not. At least it's an awareness thing. It's like being able to say, I'm on radio, you know, because uh, trying to get on FM radio or even college radio requires middlemen that you have to pay to do it. Whereas you go to Spotify, you just need to jump into an aggregation service like CD Baby will, yeah, have, you know, get you yeah. on onto Spotify, get you into iTunes. Um, I think the the allergic reaction to musicians who've been around just long enough to sort of scrape the surface and see that they're getting to be successful is the new world requirement is work hard. Like yeah. you can't just hang out in bed all day and rehearse at night you actually have to become a small business. Yeah. And I see nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, you know, obviously I was lucky and, I, and, and uh, Mick Jagger was even more lucky and Brian Eno was even more lucky and those two have talked about how it was ridiculous that we made so much money from music, you know, like yeah. there was this bell curve and you can see it if you look at it, it's, it's true, there's a massive bell curve. I, I sense what's happening to music today is we're going back to like the glory days of the 70s when Van Morrison and Neil Young just sold, you know, three to 400,000 albums in the United States and everyone was happy. Yeah. And that was when the companies were still private and they weren't on the stock market and we hadn't gone to arenas that cost $500 for the best seats and so on. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just, it's been an uptick and now it's yeah. kind of left out on the other side of the bell curve. It's like, yeah, we're, we're like we're in the 70s where everyone has a chance. Everyone yeah. has the possibility to make music, but boy, oh boy, you've got to work hard to do it these days. And yeah, there's there's a certain little meritocracy these days, isn't it? You know, yeah. uh, I think that's very clear on streaming services. The best way to make money uh, is to be popular. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah. downloads are a little different. Somebody could just, or, or purchases rather, somebody could purchase just out of mere curiosity and listen to your CD once, and yeah. it's no different to the artist. It's the same, uh, same royalty. Yeah, uh, but you have to be really popular, and you have to connect with listeners to make money on streaming and, and, yeah. and the, some of these new models. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. And well, uh, so uh, I just wanted to finish by just quickly mentioning uh, uh, the last story, which was uh, Pandora, uh, and uh, we've talked uh, about six, seven weeks ago about their acquisition of uh, KM, KXMZ FM in South Dakota. Uh, so they acquired this terrestrial radio in order to. Uh, be able to lower the fees that they pay to ASCAP in particular because ASCAP offers a uh, uh, lower fees to uh, internet radio broadcast to broadcasters that uh, operate a terrestrial radio station but also operate online and so this is essentially their way to uh, relatively cheaply acquire a station and be able to qualify for those cheaper rates and the problem now is that
that because uh, any purchase of a terrestrial radio station has to be approved by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the United States. Uh, now, ASCAP has placed a complaint with the FCC questioning the motives of uh, the acquisition, uh, which uh, are, uh, you know, as they said in the complaints, are uh, is essentially is essentially a bargaining chip and a publicity stunt. And also, uh, they question the fact that Pandora is not entirely U.S. owned, uh, which is another potential issue for radio acquisitions uh, of, of the FCC. So, uh, you know, it's hard to say whether these alone are going to uh, end up the, um, generating the decline of uh, this uh, acquisition, but it will probably de delay it. And my question is whether Pandora once again kind of uh, ended up jumping the gun a bit too quickly, uh, announcing its uh, clear intentions on the acquisition, because if, if they kept quiet about it without writing a, an entire blog post, dedicated to the issue, they probably would have passed the FCC without any problem and then they could have announced uh, this, the, what their intention was with the station afterwards. So, I don't know, do you think they shot themselves in the foot a little bit, Glenn? No, I don't think the timing uh, was, was bad. Um, yeah. They were going to have to go through this FCC approval process whether yeah. or not they issued a press release. Yeah. And it's not like that would have escaped ASCAP's attention. So, this argument on both sides would have happened eventually. Absolutely. Um, you know, Pandora is is seeking to lower rates. Um, I think they are also seeking some certainty in the repertoire that's available to them from ASCAP, and that was part of the reason for the acquisition. Also, yeah. uh, they allege that ASCAP won't tell them what publishers have pulled their rights and, and what what si what titles they actually have rights to at any given time, and yeah. that uncertainty is a problem because there are you know, potential copyright infringement issues there. So they want to know what they can, what that they've licensed, and when they've licensed it. Basically, yeah. do we have rights to this particular catalog or this particular song, or don't we? And that's that's an important part of this, along with seeking uh, lower rates that are available to, to the online operations of companies that also own broadcast radio companies. So, a, a lot of different facets here. Um, Absolutely. I, again, I don't think the timing was bad, but. Um, you know, from where I sit, it sure is entertaining. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Made for an interesting summer. It's <clears throat> definitely an interesting fight. So, summer is usually pretty dead news-wise, and this is keeping it a little bit uh, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> it's great. And and finally, I just want to ask you, Dave, uh, um, about... Uh, uh, so the, the educational side of music tech, uh, I wanted to report on, on this uh, quick story from Washington, D.C., where a librarian who works in the teens department at the Martin Luther K uh, King Jr. Public Library decided to bring in a sort of technology-based uh, uh, one-man music workshop called uh, Beats Club D.C., which is going to work with elementary and high school students about electronic music. This is a very small story. I just uh, picked it up on the, on the news feeds. Uh, and it's just nice to see sometimes uh, the idea of music technology. I mean, this guy is just... Uh, uh, has a backpack full of uh, bits and bobs, a laptop, and uh, uh, a bunch of uh, oscillators that the kids can play around with, uh, a chaos pad and all that kind of stuff, and the kids can just kind of go crazy and, and, and play this kind of stuff. Uh, Dave, what are your thoughts on, on the music education side, on on getting kids more involved in the production of music, even if it's not in a traditional sense with pianos or keyboards? Well, I think that it, <clears throat> that speaks a little bit to what I said just a little a minute or two ago about yeah. my optimism that people will create and and do great things around music because they just they just have to and then if you can step it up to an educational level that would be really awesome um, you know when I moved to the United States 25 years ago the education system seemed to be in a much better place when it came to arts and music and other cultural activities at school I and mean, even up here in Portland you know the epicenter of Portlandia um, the there are hardly any uh, arts or music programs in, in public schools. Yeah. So what tends to happen is, like you're saying here, somebody comes in from the outside and starts to help uh, introduce younger people to music. So that's, I, I have nothing other than uh, praise Absolutely. for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. um, it's nice to have a positive story at the end of the show anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I wasn't going to come, come crashing down at the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, thanks so much, guys. I, I know I can be a curmudgeon, but uh, <laughs> not every day. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me on. That was, no, great. It was great to have you on the show. And uh, anything yeah, else you. I want to plug? I mean, of course, uh, uh, on, on Glenn's side, uh, people should check out Billboard. And uh, 
it's uh, it's it's a great value subscription as well. Uh, I, you know, I I love my billboard subscription, so I would recommend people to go and check it out and uh, uh, subscribe if you can. Uh, and you also have a lot of free resources if you can't. So it's always good to keep an eye on the site. Uh, so that's that's for you, Gran. And uh, Dave, on your on your front, anything you want to plug uh, uh, in particular? Cash music, for well, example, or yeah, cash music. I, I'd encourage any uh, <clears throat> any musician and actually other artists too. Who uh, you know, we always talk about music, but it could be like an Etsy model, you know, like here, I make this stuff at home, some craft thing. Yeah. You know, the platform isn't meant just for musicians. It's a, it's a, it's an open source web platform. So cashmusic.org, uh, check it out. You could get the results of our summit, which is tomorrow. Uh, there, I think there's some live streaming out of there. And then again, September 5th, we're doing it again. Awesome. And, uh, uh, for anyone who's in Portland in September, I'm actually speaking at the Northwest Music Tech Conference on uh, Friday, September 6th at OMSI here in Portland, which should be a really fun uh, conference too. Great. All That's of what fantastic. we just said, I'm going to say again. <laughs> sure. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much, guys, for joining me. It was great having you on. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, DMT is available on a variety of channels, as I mentioned at the beginning. Check out digitalmusictrans.com or youtube.com slash digitalmusictrans. Have a great week, and till next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrans.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.